<laughs> Joey, you didn't give us a countdown, dude. Did not do it. Normally at they're all. like they do the Wayne's World thing, like yeah. five, four. <laughs> Anyway, welcome to Orient Online. So good to have you guys. Yes. Uh, I'm Jesse Allen. This is Sam. As I'm Sam. Our names already uh, popped. And don't know who this guy is, yeah. but he's in the shot. So uh, in it. Oh, Craig's <laughs> head's over there, too. Craig's yeah. head's in there. So. Yeah. So, but anyway, hey, so, so good, good to see you guys. See you guys. Yeah. 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 It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Um, it's midweek. We're excited. I have excited. one thing to do, and then he's going to say some stuff. But okay. I, uh, prepping for the service today, yes. if you have a rock around your house, some kind of small rock, go get it, clean it off. Or a big rock. And, or a big rock if you want to be crazy. But not Dwayne the Rock and grab, Not Dwayne. Don't get drained. Unless you have a cardboard cut out of him, he would that, work. That would be amazing. And yeah. then get a marker, a Sharpie, some kind of marker, and get it so you can watch the service. Yeah, because it's going to be a special be, moment. At the end of it, you're going to need that. Yeah, there's and gonna if be you don't have a rock, that's fine. Yeah. You can get the Dwayne cut out, yeah. or you can just use your Or hands. just go to your printer and print a Dwayne the Rock Johnson And then picture. just write on that. Yeah, yeah let's be go amazing. with that. I'm, so that's good. probably what I'm going to do. 100%. Yeah. But listen, anyway, we are so, so glad you. <laughs> you guys are here. So glad you've joined us for midweek. Um, this is a special service that we do here at Kensington, where we spend a little more time, like, worshiping, right? Yeah. Like, responding to God through music and through art. And so uh, we just want to yeah. invite you to join us to do that. If you're watching on YouTube, I guess, uh, hit the notification bell. You know, Make get sure you at get us all in the, the comments. Notifications. Yeah, so that way you know yeah. when these services are coming. And uh, listen, we're just super glad you guys are here. Yeah. Yeah. Fam. Cool. We'll talk to you guys at the end. See you at the end.
Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you. How was everyone's Christmas? Oh, and, and, I didn't even let you answer before I started next. How was everybody's Christmas? All right. And how was everybody's New Year going? Pretty good? Awesome. Well, if you've never been here before, my name is Matthias, one of the worship pastors around here. And one of the things we love to do around here is we just love to sing. And we love to worship uh, our King and our Savior. So that's what we're going to do a little bit of tonight. Um, but first, would you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity to, to worship among all of your people, God. Father, we get to come together, that we have the freedom to come together and worship you. to lift your name high, to make you famous, God. Jesus, my prayer is that anytime that we gather like we are tonight, that we would never, ever make this about us and the things that we're doing and the things that we're accomplishing. But God, that we would just be celebrating you and who you are and the things that you have accomplished. Jesus, the things that you have accomplished in particular, what you accomplished on that cross when you defeated death itself. We love you. We worship you tonight. It's in Jesus' name we come to you. Amen. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me he knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief oh man of sorrow son of suffering some blood and tears oh blood and tears how can Sing this. Well, there's a God. There's a God. Who oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Sing hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. The Son of distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit, to the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end the proof is in your words, yes, in the end the proof is in your
cross. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching, all praise, King Jesus. Sing.
Thank you guys. That's awesome. Good evening. Or what up, y'all? Hey, go ahead and have a seat for a couple minutes. If we've not met yet, my name is Craig. Uh, just get the joy of being a part of this team here. Hey, I'm, I'm just curious, how many of y'all joined us for one of our Christmas services that we did? All right, so uh, we took a little bit of a break. Super glad to be back with you. Uh, I thought I would tell you, you'll be the first to know, Christmas was, uh, it was incredible. Uh, six services, uh, about 5,500 people through all those services here at our campus. Amazing stories, incredible time. Yeah, that's great. Incredible time together as a team with you all. Um, can we just, one of the things, we don't do this often, but our production team, all the people from you see on stage to the ones you never see that are in the back of the room to the ones you never, never see that are like way back there somewhere in the, like, can you just thank them, the amount of time they put into it, and then to be here, to have the first service of the new year. They've just, they're an awesome team to be a part of. So if you've not been to a midweek before, we do things a little different than a weekend. And part of that is because for us, we feel like this is a chance to get to pause a little bit, have a little bit of a different environment, a little different atmosphere. Obviously, visibly, it looks a little bit different. But for us, really, what midweek is about is trying to close in a little closer to one another, to God. We, we really, we call the whole, whole time together in midweeks, we call it encounter. Our real desire and what we're trying to do here is just have a better encounter, a closer encounter with Jesus and even have a closer encounter with one another. So even for, for the, the message part of the evening, the speaking, it, it's less message and it's more, I say this all the time, more musings. It's for me, really, it's, it's just thoughts that are rambling. I don't come with message notes. It's not a big planned out series and content like we often do. Like tonight, this is it. You get my chicken scratch on a piece of paper that really is just, it's the stuff kind of pressing top of my heart right now that I just want to take a couple minutes and share with. So that's why we do a little bit different. If this is your first time with us, you're like, this looks different than a Sunday. It does, and that's why. And we try to do it that way. So whether you're in the room with us, those of you online, where'd you go? There's my online people. We're just glad that you're tuning in. We're glad that you're all a part of this this evening with us. So here's what I want to talk about tonight. One word, and then I'm going to read a little bit, uh, share a couple thoughts, and I'm going to bring up a friend of mine, Kyle, who's going to share some of his story. But the one word that I just want to talk all about this evening and circle everything around is the word invitation. Would you just say it with me so we're together? Say invitation. The book of John, the story of Jesus starting to assemble his disciples goes this way. Verse 43 of chapter 1. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, and whom the prophets also wrote about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then he answered, he says, Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What's a place in your mind that you think nothing good could come out of? Gary, Indiana. <laughs> Why, you, Gary, Indiana? You didn't even hesitate on that one. Is there a personal issue there with Gary, Indiana? Something happened there once? We don't need to know about, or who said Ohio? <laughs> Truth. The only thing good that comes out of that is a ticket half the time. Anybody ever got a ticket in Ohio? Yeah, slow down. All right, one more time. Where, where else? Where else nothing good come out of? Ohio, Gary, Indiana? What? Say Detroit? Flint? Yeah, all right, let's be honest. There's places, right? I grew up down river. I grew up in a town called River Rouge for the entire growing up. It was number one in violence and crime in all of Michigan per capita. It was a broke city. It was a violent city. It's not much better today. I could tell you for me, I often thought like nothing good comes out of River Roots. Like there's just places. It's not true, but there are places that in our minds we think for all kinds of reasons, some stereotypes, some legitimately earned, that nothing good could come from there. That's where Jesus came from. That's a whole other message. But this is Nathaniel's reaction. He says, come on, man, Nazareth? Like, Nothing good comes out of there. And then this, this, is the, this is the only response given back to him. It is opposition to the fact that possibly the Messiah could have been found, even more so that he was found in Nazareth. This was the only thing said back. Come and see. Come and see, said Philip. Just come and see. One of the hopes and the desires that we have among a list of things as we move into 2023 for our campus here, our community, for our church, is that we will see God do something 
to exponentially increase the amount of people that meet Jesus through the invitation of our lives. As simple as it sounds, as maybe obvious as it sounds, our hope is that this year, countless people, exponential amounts, will come to meet Jesus through the invitation of our lives. We take on a quick little journey. There's a couple of years, I think, that as we've gone through COVID and everything coming out of that, you all know this, the church took kind of a, a gut punch. And some of what I think has happened over the last couple of years that we need to just be aware of how it's impacted us so that we can be aware going forward, what does it mean to be the church of Jesus? I think as you came out of COVID, you, you had really one main effort among most churches. We're not unique in this. I think most churches on the other side, as we started to come out, as churches began to open their doors again, the, the main question was, how do we get people to what? Yeah, how do we get people to come back? And, and then it was, do I want to come back, right? So there's this kind of this dent. Do people want to come back? Do I want to go back into a building? Do I want to be strong? So that, that was starting to happen. So all of our emphasis was, how do we just get people to come back again? How do we get people to re-engage, whether they're in a room, whether they're on, like, how do we get re-engagement again? And then what happened is attendance in a lot of churches started going back up again. And we started to experience that as well. And then all of a sudden we went, oh boy, people are coming back. But we got nobody getting involved. Like, we have tons of things to do around here. We got coffee that gets made on Sundays. We have move out things that happen during the week. I mean, we just, there's things and lots of things that happen. So it went from how do we get people to come back to how do we get people to engage again? How do we get people to plug in? How do we get people to get involved? And then that started to tick up for us. Here's where all the focus in those two questions are. It's, it's all us. And as you've even asked those questions, do I want to come back? Am I comfortable to come back? All that, how, wherever you were at on that spectrum. Then do I want to get back involved again? I mean, golly, it was comfortable to just kind of sit and watch for a while. It was comfortable to even come back and just sit and be for a while. And so for all of us, the questions became very kind of self-focused. And I think one of the things that got lost for a lot of churches, and I wonder if it started to get lost a little bit for us, was a question beyond just whether or not we wanted to come back, whether or not we wanted to get involved. It was who are we going to invite? It was how are we gonna engage with the people around us that God's put in our life? And I think one of the things that the church has begun to see a little bit of a loss of in the last couple of years is the tenacious, passionate urgency to reach our community with the message and the hope in the person of Jesus Christ, that it's not just about us. The story of the gospel is that our God once made it not about him to make it about you and I, so that when we believe in him, we can make it not about us, but can make it about others. So that our invitation to the world around us can be, come and see. When I was in high school, I, in my 11th grade year, I met a friend of mine who, uh, to this day, we still keep in touch. He was a foreign exchange student that spent the year with us from Poland. And I remember once uh, inviting him to a, a youth group thing at our church. And he, he looked at me and he said, I'd love to go. I've never been to church. I was like, you've never been to church? He's like, no. He's like, is this a Jesus church? I was like, well, I, yeah. He's like, and this is what he says. Like, it doesn't get this, it never gets this easy. He goes, tell me about Jesus. I was like, okay, what do you want to know? He's like, everything. And he did. He, he had never heard anybody really, like he knew the name, but he knew nothing about Jesus. Like the idea that he was the son of God, that he was God incarnate, the death, were like none of it. And he just ate it up and loved it. So he ends up going to a concert with me once. It was, uh, I'm, I'm dipping back here, old school. It was DC Talk. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Some of you are like, what? Yeah. There was another era. What's that? Toby Mac. Okay, Gary and Dana. Toby Mac. So he, so he goes to this concert with me. And, and at one point, the guy speaking just makes an appeal. He says, you know, this is for all of you. And he ends up that night making a decision to give his life to Jesus. So I'm like, I'm just, I'm blown out of my mind. His name's Ismo. Like, I'm just geeking. I'm like, no way. Again, it's, it's like never is that easy hardly, right? Like somebody says, tell me about Jesus, everything. And then he gives his life to him. And so I start thinking, man, if it's that easy, my buddy, Andy Darnell, that I had been all through high school with, best friend of mine, ends up years later standing up at my wedding. I think, if it's that easy with Ismo, I've always been intimidated to tell Andy because I don't think Andy's really a religious guy. I'm not sure he's going to take it. I don't want to be the weird religious guy to him. And so I just, I didn't say anything. But then the whole experience with Ismo made me go, huh, maybe Andy will be like, tell me about the Jesus too. So I, I go to Andy one day and I start having some conversation with him and I start to like nudge into a spiritual conversation and he stops me and he goes, hey, is this about God? I was like, well, I mean, yeah, do you want to know about God? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I don't, keep the God stuff for your new foreign friend. I was like, wow, 
okay. And so I realized I was gonna have to play it a little different with Andy. So what I ended up doing once is I invited him to hang out with some friends. That's what you do when you're inviting your buddies to church and you don't wanna call it church. I'm like, hey, come hang out with my friends. He's like, is there gonna be girls there? I'm like, probably, my sister. And so, so he ends up coming. We pull up into the parking lot of the church. It was a Wednesday night. It was our youth group night. And he looks at me and he dropped all kinds of F-bombs. And he goes, is this a church? I go, yeah. He goes, take me home now. And he goes, dude, I can't believe you just did this to me. And he like loses it on me. So I, I ended up driving him back home. And then I came back again. He gets in a huge fight with me over the next couple of weeks. Like, I'm like, oh, I think we just, I just ruined our friendship. So we end up, we end up getting over it and, you know, put that behind us and all's done. And then we go through the rest of our high school. We graduate, never had a conversation with him again. Every time I ever tried, shut me down. Mom and dad went through a divorce. His parents, that's where I thought maybe I'd tow back in and shut me down. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. First year of college, midway through, I get a call. It's almost midnight, and it's Andy Darnell on the other line. And I haven't talked to him in a couple months at this point because we're off at college, separate places, doing our separate things. He calls me up. He's all frantic, and on the other end of the line, I can hear all kinds of noise in the background. He's like, hey, dude, can you hear me? I'm like, I told, yeah, I hear you. I'm at a party right now. There's this girl. Her name's Susie. I need you. I don't think her name was Susie. I don't know why I said Susie. He's like, I need you to, I need you to tell her about God. I've been trying to explain God to her, and she doesn't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what to say. She's not getting it, so tell her about God. And all of a sudden, Susie's on the phone. Can I tell you? I did not care about Susie. I didn't care what questions she had. I didn't care who she was. I'm like, well, why are you telling anybody about God and want me to not tell them about God? So finally, he gets back on the phone. I, I literally can't even tell you what I talked about with her. He gets back on the phone and he goes, all right, great. Thanks, man. I got to go. I was like, no, 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 no. You got to stay. So we, we hung out on the phone for a minute. I just had a conversation. I'm like, dude, what the heck, man? Last time I talked to you, you were like, if you say anything more about God, I'm going to throw rocks and stones at you. And now you're, and he goes, listen, he goes, all those years where I gave you all that nonsense and all that crap, he goes, I was listening every time. And then he said something that will forever stay with me. He said, and I was watching. And he said, dude, and he, this is so funny because I, at this point he didn't know that I was in college studying to be a pastor. He goes, dude, I don't know what you're in school for, but you need to stop and you need to go be a pastor. <laughs> He's like, you're convincing. I was like, well, <laughs> not as much as I thought. And, uh, and so he just, he tells me for the next couple minutes how for all those years, all the reasons why he was resistant, but that he was watching my life. And, and trust me, it wasn't perfect. I made a lot of dumb mistakes and he was front and center for many of them, but he was watching that there was something about my faith that was very real for me and very genuine, even in my mistakes and even in my dumb moments. And he just said, that's what finally got through to me. And when I was away from you, I met another guy who totally reminded me of you. And I go, how so? He goes, he was an obnoxious religious guy too. I was like, thanks. And, and he said, but he goes, I think between the two of you, I finally started to get it and it started to break free. So for, for Ismo, when I think of Ismo invitation, I think here's a guy who is a very direct invitation. It, it, was, it was kind of a come with me. You know, he wanted to know. And so I said, well, come with me. I took him to church. I took him to concerts. I took him along the ride. And then with Andy, I tried to do that, but he didn't want anything to do with it. And the invitation was less about a verbal and it was more about my life. The invitation was what he saw. Do you know that your invitation to others, to Jesus can come not just through your words. That's where we sometimes think it is, the invitation. I'm not talking about an invitation just into this building or into a church building or into a service or tune in online and listen to somebody. I'm talking especially about the invitation that your life makes as an appeal in the way that you live. The Apostle Paul once put it this way, and I don't think I could say it any better, so I'll just read it as he wrote to the Corinthian church. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel... I found that the Lord had already opened a door for me. That's so key. If you have a Bible, you may even want to follow along. This is one I encourage you to write down, underline, circle. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, when I went there to preach the gospel, I found that the Lord had already opened the door for me. Do you know this? Do you know that the people God has in your life, that by the time we get to the end of this evening, I'm going to ask you who they are. I'm going to ask you to think about them. I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to keep them present to your prayers, present to your thoughts this year. Do you know that God's already going ahead of you? Do you know that he's already working to open the doors of conversation, to open the doors of logic, to open the doors of emotion, to open all the doors that need to get opened? You know he's already going ahead of you. This isn't just on you. This isn't something you have to make happen. God is going ahead of you. Why? Because whoever it is that you love and you want to know Jesus, he loves them more. 
He said, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and I went on my way to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal process, procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him, the aroma of the knowledge of him. Now watch what he says on this. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Like he's even admitting it. He's like, listen, God makes an appeal through us. Our lives become an aroma. And he even says like, who's up to this task? And he's admitting like, God is asking us to participate in the mission to make him known among all of the world. Like what a task. Even Paul acknowledges like, who's up to this task? And then he goes on and he says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. I don't know if you believe this about your life, but you are sent from God for others. Do you know that? God once made it not about him to make it about you so you and I in relationship with him can make it not about us but make it about others. The last couple of years, I think, has made us forget that a little bit. And I don't know us here. I'm saying us in general, the church. I mean, this is what I do. I'm connected to a lot of people in this world and I think all the people I talk to, we agree like something has gotten lost in the last couple of years. Something has fallen out of our memories and our minds and the passion of our heart to realize this is what God does through us. He makes the appeal. So my question is, Paul says our life can be either an aroma of life or death. What is yours? Like is your life, is it the sweet smell of life for Jesus? Does it draw? Does it attract? Does the very way you live, you don't have to say a word, but it creates an invitation out of you. Is it a, an aroma of life? Or is it an aroma of death? Because let's be honest, there's a lot of people that carry the Christian name, that go to church regularly, and, and we can very easily be angry, judgmental, hateful, silent, all kinds of other adjectives that would create from us an aroma of death, an aroma that would attract nobody to anything, that would do the opposite and repel. Our lives are intended to be an aroma. I would say this, your life is an aroma. It is. The question isn't, is it? It's what kind of aroma is it? That's why this year, I hope and I pray that God will do something in all of our hearts, in my heart, in your heart, in all of our hearts, that will begin to expand and explode a passion that maybe for some of us we've lost, maybe for some of us we've never taken hold of because we didn't realize that God literally makes his appeal to humanity through you, through me. And there are people that he has already gone ahead of you and he is working to open the doors for. You and I just have to ask regularly, what is the aroma of our life? So I wanna bring up my friend Kyle because some of you, maybe you remember Kyle, he was here. Uh, well, he's been here. Kyle's part of the community here, but he was here on this stage not too long ago when we had our baptism service. He was one of the guys that got baptized, shared just a brief moment of his story. And there is so much of this in his story. And so just as I've been getting to know Kyle, uh, I thought it would be a really cool moment as we kicked off this year, and especially under this theme, just to hear a little bit more about his story and how it is that God has used those in his life to draw him in relationship. So would you guys just welcome up Kyle? Cool. So make sure it works. So why don't you give us like, like just start off with like a quick basic introduction. You are Kyle who? Yes, I'm Kyle. <laughs> uh, I said short. Sure. Uh, Craig told me to start at the beginning, so uh, strap yourselves in. We'll be here for the next uh, three and a half to four hours, <laughs> and uh, I'll get you home before midnight, I promise. Uh, no. Um, so, yeah, I grew up uh, like a lot of people. Um, I got baptized as a baby. Um, I got confirmed into the church in, in a, uh, grade school, and then I had every summer... Uh, I went to uh, a, a religious camp, and uh, it was actually funny. So there was this uh, competition at the camp every year, and the, the competition was uh, who could memorize the most Bible verses. And uh, 
I had convinced myself that if I won, that made me the most religious guy there. But I like think varsity. it was, yeah, yeah, I think it was more like well, maybe it was a mix of like faith and my competitiveness that <laughs> led to it. But uh, I did win, so that was cool. How many how many verses did you have to memorize? Uh, so there was a list of like a hundred and it's whoever memorized the most. Okay. Um, and you know, I went to church every Sunday. Uh, I don't know if it was necessarily because I wanted to go or because my grandma made me, but I was there. (laughs) Anybody, Um, (laughs) anybody's grandma made you go to church growing up? Um, it was my mom and dad made me. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I, thought of myself as a pretty faithful guy then. And uh, hmm. the, the problem I ran into, ran into is that my faith had never really been tested. Hmm. And if there was a, like a written test or like a grade that you could get when hmm. uh, your faith gets tested for the first time, hmm. I always joke uh, with my wife. So in school, I was part of the 50% of the class that made the top 50% possible. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, good. when my faith got tested the first time, I, I failed that test miserably. Uh, I did not do well at all. I got an F. If there was like a, if there was like a, uh, an M or a, like, <laughs> right, a, like, a, like a Q, right. <laughs> that, that would have been got. my grade. Um, after uh, high school, I, uh, I went to college for a short period of time, and then 9-11 happened, and I, I, I joined the military. Um, and that was the, f- the first time my faith was actually tested. Because, you know, I was, I was pretty strong in what I believed, but I had never really come into any situation where hmm. it was, I had need to make that decision. Right. Um, right. During my time there... I, uh, I, I saw, I did get to see some of the best of humanity, but I also got to see mm. some of the worst of it. Um, and uh, there, there came a time after I had, you know, buried so many friends and carried so many caskets. And mm. um, my relationship with God became tenuous at first. And then, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but like, like almost a point of like hate. Yeah, and then uh, from there, I think it's just human nature in general that once you uh, have so much anger towards something for such a long period of time, it just becomes this point of indifference, mm. which is even worse because at least sure. when you when you dislike something, you're, you're at least, least thinking, yeah, right. you're, you're thinking about it at yeah. least, and it it came to this place where I just didn't even think about it anymore. Mm. And, uh, and that lasted for, for, for quite some time. Um, and then, you know, I, so when I was in the military, I, I fancied myself a warrior, uh, which, which in my mind, uh, I thought that meant that I wouldn't make it to the age of 30. Hmm. So uh, I think our lives are kind of, like no one's born with this innate, you know, knowledge of what life leads to. Right. Um, so, like, I think that the life is kind of a series of awakenings. Mm. And that was really one of my first awakenings when I had my 30th birthday. Mm. And I, I was like, oh, my gosh. I, there, there's going to be here. something after this. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't know what it was. Mm. And uh, I, I struggled a lot um, when I came home. And I didn't... I didn't have anything strong to fall back on, hmm. so I fell back on like self-medicating and uh, things of that nature, um, which was not the right decision. Um, sure. Now and, you're, but at this point, you're out of the military. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, I I worked. Um, I found success in life, but I didn't really know what that was and I always felt like something was missing I just didn't know what Hmm. Um, and then eventually I met my wife and at first she uh, initially introduced me uh, to the church that didn't go over well I'll be honest (laughs) Um, I the, gave like like how so? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you I gave a lot well. of pushback. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not yeah. a chance. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and her mom as well, who's uh, my mother-in-law Gail, who's in the, the audience uh, tonight. Um, 
Yeah, she attempted to reintroduce me mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit, and uh, I gave a lot of pushback, a lot. Um, they, uh, they, they, for the most part, gently, gently tried to nudge me in the right direction. Uh, there were times when hmm. some of my struggles became pretty strong and I got some like 300 kicks to the chest <laughs> and to go to the right way. Um, and then it, it eventually came to this point where I, I didn't know what I could do anymore. Uh, and they really opened a door for me. Hmm. And you and I had talked earlier about um, you know, what led me to uh, you know, accepting, re-accepting Christ and yeah. uh, God into my life. And you, know, you asked me, like, I can't remember how you phrased it, but I couldn't, like I was racking my brain to think <laughs> of like uh, one specific thing that made, like, not made me, but got me yeah. to accept it. And yeah. uh, to be honest, I don't think there was. They, I had these people in my life mm. that, that loved me, and they opened a door, mm. and I don't think it was up to me to make the decision. I think mm. uh, God and Christ are the ones that actually made the decision to you know, pull me through it. Yeah, but I love, I love that too, because I think sometimes we make, we make too much about a big moment. Like there has to be a moment, what was the moment? And I think for most people, there isn't a moment. It's what you're saying, it's a gradual journey I mean, because everything even with Jesus is a journey. So why wouldn't it be a journey towards him as opposed to just a flip-flop of one? It's like somebody just flipped on a switch and one day it's just like, oh, now I started a journey with God. It's a, it's a journey in general. It didn't just begin. It happens gradually. So what, like, is your wife, Sarah, is she's kind of making the nudges or, or the kicks to the chest you're saying? Like, what are you thinking as you're watching her own spiritual journey and you're, you're in your place of indifference? It's kind of more of a uh, no. Uh, just my personality type alone is like, you should do this. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, that's just who I am. Um, so, like, I said, like you had mentioned opening the door, and like I said, they opened the door for me. I just needed something else to mm. bring me through it. And then I love, you told me once, I would love you to tell people here, like when you first came to Kensington even, like you had, you had a bit, this was not the kind of church that you thought you'd land in, that you oh, thought no, you'd be a part a, of. Oh no, not a thousand so like, years. Like tell, tell them even about just, not in a thousand years. <laughs> like, tell, tell them a little bit about just like what you were thinking that whole day and why, why from not in a thousand years to here you are sitting on the stage telling your story. Yeah, no, so Sarah, my wife, she went to the uh, Kensington and Troy for a number of years. And, uh, you know, she described it to me, and I was like, I'm not going to a, a rock and roll church. Not, not going to happen. Like, I grew up in a church where everything happened, like, the first five minutes, this, was, this is what yeah. you did. The yeah, next yeah, yeah. 20 minutes, this is what you did. And yeah. then, you know, it lasted 60 minutes on the dot. You went That's down. That's basically what we do, right? 60 minutes on the dot. <laughs> when Sam preaches. You go down to the basement, you grab donuts, coffee, you go home. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was pretty uh, reluctant and mm. hesitant um, and gave a lot of pushback. But when I did make the decision that I wanted to give this a real try, mm. uh, Sarah and I, we did, I would say, kind of shop churches <laughs> and uh, went to a number of them and then... Mm. Uh, she eventually convinced me to come to Kensington. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the sermon you gave that day, it was one that I really connected with. Mm. And it's been interesting because every sermon sense is something that I've had a connection with in some way. Um, so, I mean, not to pat you on the well, back. Well, it's because Sarah's but... feeding me material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not to pat you on the back, but you were a big part of, uh, of why uh, we really fell in love with this church. Hmm. And, that's, and that's also cool. It's the whole thing, right? It's your mother-in-law. It's your wife. It's your grandmother all those years ago. It's the, the, all of those nudges. Even church experience, it made you resistant. And then you, like, it's just all of it comes together. It's all of that that God works out together to be really that invitation. That's where, like, I love how Paul put it. 
God has already gone ahead of us, opening the doors. Like, God was already going ahead of you, going ahead of Sarah, going ahead of your grandmother, going ahead of your mother. Like, he was doing all of that work, opening up those doors, like you said, even before you realized it, so that when it was ready, when it was the moment, that door would be open. Yeah. And, and like you said earlier, it's, it's kind of our job to, uh, I don't know how to say it, not our job, but it's something we should strive to do to, mm-hmm. to help others and, and open doors for them and... Um, gently nudge them and maybe at times give them a kick to the chest. Uh, but they will eventually, with the door open, find the way to go forward through it. Yeah. So let me ask you this. And, and I know that these hypothetical questions are always weird to necessarily answer. But without Sarah, without your mother-in-law, without those nudges, would you be here right now? I would like to to say yes, but I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't think so because I didn't have anyone in my life that was, you know, reintroducing me to my faith. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, no, probably not. Um, mm-hmm. Unless someone else was introduced into my life that opened that door for me, I don't, I don't think I would be. So yeah. it, it is really... Uh, Testament to to their um, uh, strength, I guess, and putting mm-hmm. up with me, <laughs> <laughs> and their uh, ability not to give up on me. Mm. Uh, that that got me to where I am right now. Yeah, and I think you know the one thought I always have to a question like what I just asked is, you know, maybe not, maybe you wouldn't be here, but you said maybe God would have brought somebody else, and so I always think to me it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter so much if the answer is yes or no, I wouldn't be here, because I think you're right. I do think that God will bring, if God's pursuing you, he'll bring somebody else. If it's not Sarah, it's gonna be a neighbor. It's gonna be a, a coworker. It's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a brother in the military. But that means that I'd miss those opportunities, right? If it's somebody in my life and I say no, will God still grab hold of their heart? Probably, but I miss the opportunity to be involved in that process. Like if I hadn't shared with Andy, if I hadn't shared with Ismo, would they, would they know Jesus today? Maybe. I can't say for sure yes or no, but I do know I can say for sure I wouldn't have been a part of that story. I wouldn't have been a part of that journey. No, without a doubt. And I think um, for a lot of us, for me specifically, uh, like we had talked out, out here earlier, I think there's, uh, there, there's, as a man, there's two real struggles in your life, and the first struggle is uh, is faith. Um, mm. I, I I I believe that if you don't question things, you're not going to believe as strongly in it. Yeah. Um, the second biggest struggle is, is marriage. Um, mm. So the <laughs> it's like a nervous laughter right now. <laughs> yeah, I know. For all of you that are sitting next to your spouse, and like, <laughs> all the guys uh, are like, not for me, babe. I don't know what that guy's promise. <laughs> but I think that once you find uh, a, a strong belief and a strong set in your faith, mm. uh, the second one mm. becomes significantly easier. It's a good word. Yeah. I, w- I would even say any struggle we have in life, the first place to go to deal with that struggle is here. You, you get it right with you and the Lord, you and Jesus, it begins to work its way out into any other struggle you've got. I 100% agree. Awesome, cool. Hey, would you guys just thank Kyle for uh, coming up and sharing a bit of his story with all of us? Thanks, man. So here's what I'd love you to do tonight. We've got two more songs the band's gonna lead us through. Over here on both sides of these openings and the aisles are baskets full of rocks. I would love at some point when you feel it's appropriate for you, or honestly, maybe you don't feel it's appropriate for you tonight, so don't fake it, but if it's a real moment, here's what I'd love you to do, is to come up, grab one of these stones, grab a Sharpie with you, go back to your seat with them, and I want you to write at least a single name. Maybe you've got more, but at least a single name on here that's somebody in your life, that's a Kyle, that's an Ismo, that's an Andy, that's somebody that God has put in your life that you just desperately wanna see them know the Lord. Know the hope, know the joy, know the salvation, know the peace, know the very real God who made them. 
Somebody that you will be dedicated over the course of this next year to pray for, to look for the moments of open opportunity. Not to be the obnoxious Christian, but to say, all right, God, if you're really going before me, if you're doing this, like Paul wrote, he's going before me to open doors, then show me when you open them. Show me how to step through them because I don't wanna be the kind of Christian that just makes it all about me, all about me. Not when we serve a God that made it all about you and not him so that we can make it all about others and not us. So here's what I'd love you to do. Come grab a stone at some point over the next two songs, take it back to your seat, write that name on it. Any ideas why we might write it on a stone? Come on, y'all. What was Jesus' name? The Rock. The Rock. Long before Dwayne Johnson, he was the Rock. We want, our, we want the people we love to meet the rock who loves them. So when you feel like it's appropriate, grab one, write down the name, and what an incredible thing it could be two months from now, three months from now, 12 months from now, maybe two years from now, to sit in this room beside them where they worship the Jesus who died for them, who maybe at this moment, they're pushing away, but he's pursuing.
pretty good midweek to start the year off, huh? So that whole song, I don't know if you know this, it's based out of a verse in Galatians Paul wrote. It said chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. So the life that I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life up for me. May we be those people this year making the appeal to those around us that God is already opening the doors for so thankful you guys kicked off our first midweek with us. Can't wait to do it again next midweek. But don't forget, this Sunday, we're launching a brand new series as well. So hopefully we'll see you back for that too. Have a great rest of the night. I got my rock. Did you write a rock? I, I do. It's over there, though. So I, I wrote on mine, me, and but... I can show you because the marker broke while I was writing. <laughs> But then I wrote little on the top and on the bottom. But hopefully you take like this token yeah. and it inspires you yeah. moving forward to continue to share what God's doing in your life, really. Yeah. With really, others. and invite them into yeah. what you're already doing. Yeah. And literally making disciples. Well, That's the thing, yeah, the thing is, <laughs> man, it's like if, if this stuff has impacted us and changed yeah. our life, 100%. why would we not yeah. want to share that with yeah. others, right? Well, and like Craig's story, some people will openly accept it and go, yeah, I want to know the Jesus you yeah. know. What is that? Yeah. You know, And others will go, Heck no. Yeah, no, I'm not in. But <laughs> and that's, needless to say, we just walk through that with them and yeah. be able to I mean, to the say, Bible talks about us being, sowing seeds, right? 100%. We yeah. sow the seeds yeah. and God's the one yeah. that waters them. Absolutely. So our job yeah. is to just sow the seeds. So hopefully... Invite someone into your life. Yeah, absolutely. And let and, your life and speak to them. join us on Sunday, right? Yeah. We're launching a brand new series brand new that we're series calling ID Renewal, and uh, it's going to be a powerful week. Uh, Craig is speaking this yeah. Sunday. This guy's so, saying hi. Yeah, Jackson's going to be there. We're <laughs> going to be there. So we're excited. Again, thank you guys so for joining us for midweek. Have a great night.